All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are approaching West Texas. That's W-E-S-T, West Texas, where we hope to uh, participate in the rededication of the Texas historical marker for the crash at Crush. This event starts at 10 o'clock, and your host, in his typical fashion, is running a few minutes late. But we are now arriving in West, and we are now exiting the West exit, and uh, we'll be at the Katy Depot in a few moments. So, you kids, stay tuned. We're gonna find out what this is all about. The great Texas train wreck, crash and crush, rededication ceremony. Heard a little bit about it this morning as the uh, mayor and the commissioner had it in their proclamations. And so what I'm going to tell you is going to probably deviate just a bit, not very much, of the actual historical events that are still somewhat in question as far as if you start comparison, doing a comparison to all the different stories that you have out there. So bear with me as we take a trip and learn about the crash and crush. What was the crash? And it was one of those spectacular and hyped events of the 20th, 20th century. Two steam locomotives were intentionally crashed into one another for public amusement and private gain. So I want you to imagine that you're colliding intentionally two spaceships running head on into one another. That's what happened on this day 115 years ago. Now let's go back in time and let's place ourselves in the 1890s. Let's try to make sense of all of this. First, what was Crush? Crush was actually the name of the person who thought up the whole event. William George Crush. He was a promoter extraordinaire, a friend of the greatest showman of all time, P.T. Barnum. And our man Crush just happened to be the special agent to the vice president of Missouri, Kansas, and Texas Railroad, MKT, K, for short as we know it today. In 1896, just as today, the country and many businesses were in financial crisis. Railroads were competing heavily for freight and passenger traffic. Now challenged to increase market share, old Willie Crush came up with a brilliant idea. Why not put on a monster train wreck and make some money for the railroad by charging $2 a head to a route for a round trip ticket from anywhere in the Katy Railroad network? Well, railroad officials in St. Louis were just absolutely ecstatic about this, and they said, go ahead, Willie, do what you got to do. So Crush was soon off and running with a massive PR campaign. He had billboards, and posters, and articles about the event, and created hype all the way from California to New York and even Europe. So why was the site just south of town the chosen site? Well, the MKT needed to gain more ridership in Texas. The main line connecting Dallas and Fort Worth with the rest of the state ran through a shallow valley with hills on three sides. This created a perfect amphitheater. And guess what? It was just 15 miles north of Waco and only 3.8 miles from where we're sitting here today, south of town. And it was right in the heart of Texas. Perfect spot, says Willie. So in 1896, this area was on the site of E.E. E. Dickerson and Doc John Foyt Farms. And for those traveling down Interstate 35 today, if you take the Wiggins Road exit and you look over to the east, and there's a property that is owned now by Arnold Mayberry is where the site was located. Now, close your eyes for just a moment. I know the sun's out there. It might help you a little bit. And let's imagine a four-mile track two telegraph offices, two water wells, and a jail. Yes, a jail. Crush City sprang up in a few days. It was a real sideshow with a block-long food tent, a midway, lemonade stands, saloons, and the splash of Barnum and Bailey Big Tops. It took 200 policemen to control the crowds and corral the pickpockets, drunks, and unfortunately the lost children. And it was no wonder it was such an amazement. At the time, Waco only had about 10,000 people in its population. Dallas, 40,000. And for one day, for one day,
Rush became the largest city in Texas with crowds approaching 50,000 people. So what happened uh, on that day of September 15, 115 years ago? Well, it was about 4.30 in the afternoon, two diamond stacked wood burning locomotives, each with tinder boxes and six box cars, were given a test run. Pictures were taken. And the trains back to their starting points. And as you heard earlier from the mayor telling you that Willie Crush sat atop a white stallion horse, and he had a white hat, and he held it up in the air. And he gave the signal to start the trains by the dropping of his hat. At the time the hat dropped and hit the ground, whistles let out death screams, and trains began to roll. Gaudily painted in reds and greens, numbers 999 and 1001. Both engineers locked their throttles, and they jumped into the crowds as the train picked up speed. Seconds later, at speeds of up to 60 miles an hour, the trains collided with a shattering boom. Flying debris and billowing smoke filled the area. The locomotives reared up, falling on the sides. First, there was silence. Then, in seconds, the unthinkable. The boilers of both engines simultaneously exploded, launching missiles of metal into the air and into the crowd. And in the blink of an eye, a publicity stunt turned deadly. So you're probably wondering, who was thinking about all this and thinking, wasn't there going to be some type of a problem or some injuries? Well, no one really asked the question. There was only one Katie engineer, though, that did dare challenge the big bosses in St. Louis. It was old man Horanahan. He said, they'll bust and kill people all over the place. He said in his Irish brogue. He was ignored at the time, but his words were very prophetic. Now let's turn back to the scene of destruction. After the two trains collide and the boilers burst, those spectators nearest to collision tried to escape, but it was far too late. They are all jammed together unable to get away from the spinning bits of metal showering down. And in the front row was photographer J.C. Dean. He whirls around, his face bloody from the injuries. Louis Bergstrom, another member of the photography team, is knocked unconscious by a flying plank. And then there was Ernest Darnell. He was sitting in the tree, and he was hit in the head, and his skull was split. He later died in Waco. Many others are burned by steam and flying hot metal. A Confederate soldier who was on scene said it was like a civil war battle, people falling all around him. The huge crowd stood stunned for minutes. And recovering from the shock and realizing the danger was over, thousands of people poured over the smoking ruins to pick up souvenirs. Now the ending of our tale. The railroad board braced themselves for a massive damage lawsuit. Crush was fired before sundown, but just like today's reality shows, sensation sells. And so news of the crash and crush gained headlines across the world overnight. The Katie's business picked up speedily. Willie Crush was rehired within a few days. The word Katie was on the lips of every man, woman, and child in America. And for years afterwards, the story was regularly repeated, giving impossible publicity in other media circles. But for the danger of human life, the crash and crush would no doubt have been replicated many, many times. And to this day, no railroad has ever had the nerve to repeat such a situation. Thus, the highlights of the crash and crush.